Hi, I'm Ashton, and today I'm gonna complain about psychology. I don't know what I'm gonna call this video yet, but uh, in my heart, it's called I got a psychology degree and now I hate psychology. And essentially that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I am breaking this video down into like a few sections. Um, I'm gonna do a little intro. I'm gonna talk about my personal experiences and I'm gonna talk about kind of my larger socio-political thoughts surrounding psychology as a discipline, and then I'm going to talk about a couple other assorted related things. I mentioned wanting to make this video in my last video, and a lot of you were very thrilled about the idea, so um, here I am. I hope that this lives up to your expectations. I do first want to give an overarching content warning um, for ableism, especially against autistic people, mentally ill people, anyone with any sort of non-normative psychological experience. Um, I figured that would probably go without saying, but it would be better to like say it than to not say it. Um, I also am going to be mentioning things such as racism, eugenics, um, scientific quote unquote racism, but it may be upsetting if that is something that you are not prepared to hear about right now. So make sure you are in an okay place to hear about that. If you aren't, that's fine. Don't feel bad about it. Take care of yourself. So for a bit of like personal context, I went to a public school in the South. Um, my experiences, therefore, are not universal. But when I talk about my own personal experiences, I don't want that to deter you from studying psychology if that is something that you really want to do. And I studied psychology and I thought I wanted to go into it and now I do not feel that way anymore. Um, and I know that that experience is not only one that I have had slash am having. Um, and I, of course, as usual, would encourage you to share any experiences that you have had similar or otherwise in the comments if you feel so inclined. But regardless, my experiences in this context are far from universal. Um, I'm sure other schools are vastly different, but I'm autistic. Uh, I'm quote unquote in remission from depression, whatever that means. I also have diagnosed anxiety and OCD, but honestly, a lot of those symptoms I think are better explained by my autism. Um, and yeah, not every autistic person is going to feel the same way I do. I already said that. Um, I just want to make that really clear. So I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology as opposed to a Bachelor of Science. They are relatively similar, but there's a couple differences. Uh, it also differs based on what school you go to. It's not like a dramatic difference. A Bachelor's of Science just typically takes like one or two more neuroscience courses. I took enough coursework to uh, have the background to make these complaints. Um, so I'm not coming out of a place of like being uneducated on this topic because I literally have a degree in it. For the best, most robust context I can give you, um, I came into college knowing that I wanted to uh, pursue a psychology degree. I I think around two years in, like two and a half years in, I was like, mm, I don't want a psychology degree anymore, um, but it was kind of too late to change it. So instead I added a degree and I have a dual, I did a dual major, double major um, and a minor. but the psychology is what's relevant, so that's what I'm going to focus on. In terms of psychology, I have taken Psych 101, I took that in high school, um, Intro to Clinical Psychology, Statistical Principles of Psychological Research, I've taken Biopsychology, Intro to Cognitive Psychology, Research Methods of Psychology, Social Psychology, Quantitative Psychology, Current Psychological Topics, um, which was a course on minority youth development, and psychopathology. I know some things, right? I would hope at this point. I think that's all of my disclaimers out of the way, so I want to talk you through my, like, five major complaints slash instances of problematic things that happened to me while I was studying psychology. The first thing is a broad under-recognition slash under-appreciation for the minority stress model. Um, which is admittedly a relatively recent development. However, I think it's a very, very, very important one when you talk about marginalized groups within psychology at all. Um, and despite a lot of my classes discussing or mentioning marginalized groups, the minority stress model was like nowhere to be found. Um, and if you're unfamiliar, the minority stress model essentially says a lot of like diagnoses that minorities are given directly stem from the stress that they are under because they are a part of that minority or that oppressed group. Um, it was developed to talk about LGBT folks or LGB folks specifically, um, but it has since been expanded and I'll talk a bit more about the minority stress model later. It is not as 
significant of a part of the curriculum as I believe it should be. It was mostly discussed in courses about marginalized groups, which are not courses that are required, which in my opinion is a little bit messed up because if you go to practice psychology, you are going to interact with marginalized people. And if you don't understand that diagnoses are oftentimes misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed because of how traumatic events can present in different marginalized pop populations and because of how the medical industrial complex as a whole treats people badly. Um, and psychology is no stranger to that. And I wish that was something that psychologists talked about when training like new psychologists. I think it's one of the most important things for any psychologist to understand but it is not something that a lot of psychologists care about as I came to find out. Um, the second thing is ABA therapy and complete disregard for the broad autistic dislike of it. Um, I'm not going to delve a lot into ABA therapy right now. Um, that's a different video and I don't know if I'll ever make that video. Um, there is a lot of discussion about it all the time, but largely as a whole, there is a more or less broad consensus within autistic communities that ABA therapy is abusive. A lot of people who have been through the practice find it abusive, traumatic. I do want to mention that some Black autistic people do find ABA therapy somewhat helpful in some situations. Um, there is debate on it and it's not something that is really my place to debate. I will link an article. It's an article by a Black autistic woman responding to a lot of controversy within the Black autistic community about whether or not ABA therapy is appropriate for Black autistic kids. It's not my place to have an opinion on that, but I am directing you towards the people who should have opinions on it, and I encourage you to listen to them. Back to the problem at hand, the course that I took that discussed ABA the most was Psychopathology, which I took in my last semester, and it was um, by and large my least favorite psychology course that I took. I did did not like the professor, which didn't help, um, and it was a massive classroom where no one wore masks, which also didn't help, but it, it was a really rough class for me, and I got an A in it. It's not that I'm bad at it, it's just that I dislike it. So the way that ABA therapy was presented in this class was as something that is helpful for a lot of autistic kids. And they did mention that some autistic people don't like it. The way that I learned about ABA therapy is by my autistic peers being like, this shit is abusive. I went through this shit and it was traumatic. The way that ABA therapy is presented in psychological classes is some autistic people don't like this very much. And that's pretty much the end of it. Um, we literally had to like take a little poll on the on the smart board that was like, well, some autistic people don't like ABA therapy, but the parents of autistic people say that it's really helpful. So should we do ABA therapy? And it was just really infuriating to see this question posed to a bunch of like future psychologists that is basically, well, the people that we're treating really hate this and think it's like abusive or whatever. But like, obviously, since it makes life easier for their parents, we should keep doing it, right? That was the kind of framing. Um, and that made me feel like shit. This is also a problem that I had in that same class, but it is something that I experienced through a lot of my psychology classes, uh, is a complete disregard for language preferences. Um, if you are unaware, a lot of autistic people, myself included, prefer identity first language, whereas a lot of um, psychologists tend to use person first language. And this is something that like differs based on the individual person, and it differs based on the individual like disabled circle, right? Kind of complicated and I'm not going to go through all of it right here right now, but generally in capital A autistic spaces especially, um, autistic person is preferred to person with autism. My teacher for psychopathology had a like anonymous feedback form and I put that into her anonymous feedback form because she kept saying people with autism um, or like people afflicted with autism or people suffering from autism. And I was like, hey, just so you know, there's an autistic person in this class and a lot of us prefer identity first language in terms of autism. Um, that being autistic person and not person with autism. She, it was up on the board, like the whole class saw it and she read it and just didn't, it didn't process in her head. She was just like, she read it, she turned around to the class and she was like, yeah, so a lot of people with autism prefer to be called people with autism, not autistic people, because that's like dehumanizing, which it's not as an autistic person. Um, I don't know if it was just like, it slipped her mind or if she just didn't read it or if she just didn't care. But it sucked really bad 
to say directly to my teacher, like, the way that you are discussing autistic people is uncomfortable and some people would find it offensive, and for her to just completely ignore that and keep doing exactly what she was doing. I had a lot of other classes where teachers would say people with autism, I would correct them. Sometimes they would listen, sometimes they wouldn't. The only course where my professor consistently used autistic people instead of people with autism was my disability studies course. This was especially frustrating in one specific case in my psychopathology class where my professor brought up Temple Grandin, who is a very famous, very smart autistic person, um, who has publicly multiple times stated that she prefers to be called an autistic person to a person with autism. And yet, guess what my professor called her? A person with autism. It just is this really large pattern where psychologists do not seem to care about the preferences of the people that they are treating. Um, I had a lot of other issues with this professor, as well as just the way that psychopathology is taught in general. Um, another thing this professor did, which is not on my list, but I think is telling, pretty much at the beginning of the course. Uh, she is like a professor, right, but she also does clinical psychology in the carceral system. And one of the, literally one of the first things she said to the whole class was like, you guys should be so glad that there are psychologists in prisons because some of these people really need to be locked up. And I was so taken aback. Like I came into this class as an abolitionist, right? I came into that class as an autistic person who hates prisons. And to hear that come out of my professor's mouth when like that was the last course I needed to take to get a degree, I was like, it was shocking. It was horrifying. And I, like, I think that was the moment where I was like, okay, I already knew that I really dislike a lot of what is happening in the field of psychology, but like, that solidifies it. That is it. That's, I'm done. Um, and uh, I sat outside of that classroom for the large majority of the semester, A, for COVID reasons, because no one in that massive room wore a mask, um, and B, because I couldn't, I just couldn't sit in there. Um, it sucked. It sucked to hear talk. It sucked to continually be called things that I don't feel comfortable with being called. Um, it sucked to not be listened to and, and especially for her to posture in like, oh, I'm always taking feedback. I'll always take anonymous feedback. And then, you know, completely disregard it. The fourth thing that I experienced a lot and disliked was tokenization. Um, frequently, I would be the only trans and or autistic person in psychology classes. I was always the only trans and autistic person in psychology classes. Um, and especially in smaller classes, if you are open about that, um, I was tokenized a lot. The professor would ask me questions instead of like teaching. And that's okay sometimes. Um, but I think it is definitely worse when you are not asked. There are times when like I'm okay being tokenized, right? But that's a very individual thing. And if you are teaching a group and someone in that group identifies with the things that you are teaching about and you direct all of your energy towards them, single them out, ask them questions, put them on the spot, not all of us are going to be comfortable with that. And I don't think it's a good default way to teach. Um, and I don't think that should be shocking, but it is still something that a lot of my professors did. It was Intro to Clinical Psychology, um, where I was there, and I'm an autistic trans person, if that wasn't clear, um, and then a classmate who, black trans person, was also there. And we were like the default go-to to ask questions, and it was bad for both of us. But every single class where like diversity was mentioned, the professor would look at us. Um, we would both be singled out for the things that we were the only one of. And we would pretty frequently talk to each other after class and be like, hey, like this sucks, right? Yeah, okay, cool, have a good day. And it, it was nice to have someone else that like got it. I wish it was not happening at all. My last point in the My Experiences section is just a general uh, issue. Academia is outdated on information about marginalized groups. It always is. Um, this is something I've talked about before, this is something I talked about in my video about being trans in academia, but like that, it's just always how it is. Activists are always going to be a step ahead, people on the ground are always going to be a step ahead, and that is the case for language, theorizations of gender, that's the case for theorizations of neurodivergency, that's something that psychology as a whole doesn't give a shit about. Generally, I find that it is the case that the people going through stuff are going to be more knowledgeable about it than the people who are studying it. Um, 
especially when it is something regarding marginalization and oppression. It's really disorienting, almost, to exist in, like, circles of anarchists and circles of abolitionists and circles of disabled people, circles of trans people, circles of queer people, etc., etc., um, who, you know, understand each other and know each other and exist in the same political way, and then go into academia where your professor is like, yeah, people definitely prefer to be called people with autism, because it's just not the case. It says a lot to me that uh, even when the people directly involved in activism go to academics and are like, hey, we don't say this anymore. Some academics are like, um, anyway, as I was saying, uh, I'm gonna say a slur now. <laughs> okay, that concludes the most memorable of my personal experiences in psychology as an autistic student. Um, but I want to talk about some of my larger thoughts and issues with the field as a whole. Um, and this is the part where I'm going to talk a bit more about racism, eugenics, uh, other types of oppressive ideologies, just heads up. There's nothing liberatory going on in terms of psychology, right? It has very fucked up roots. Like, it comes from a very fucked up place in a lot of cases. A lot of things that were once in the DSM are now things that everybody understands as never should have been in the DSM. I actually have old copies of the DSM uh, that I inherited that are very interesting. But maybe I should do a video where I go through all of the, like, pathologizations of sexuality, because that's something that is so fascinating to me. There is no end to the ways in which psychology is historically fucked up, and I'm only going to talk about a few of them. Psychology is very, very intertwined with white supremacy. It is very, very intertwined with misogyny. It is very, very intertwined with eugenics. We'll get more to that in a minute. Um, it is also very, very intertwined with transphobia and homophobia, and obviously ableism. We've already covered that, right? Um, but statistics is one that I think is particularly interesting. I really like statistics. You can probably tell based on the courses that I mentioned. I enjoy doing statistics, I enjoy doing research, um, but what they don't tell you is that statistics was built by eugenicists. Um, like, the whole platform of statistics exists because eugenicists thought it would be helpful for them, and it was, and that's how eugenics happened. Eugenics is frequently discussed as something that was kind of built up in Nazi Germany. Um, it was not. Germans stole it from Americans. Um, not that it's something Americans should be proud of, but America did very, very effective uh, racist eugenics, a lot of racist sterilization, a lot of really, really awful things, and you can learn more about it if you look it up, feel free to. Um, but eugenics and statistics are so intricately intertwined in terms of their history and how they came to be that it felt very bizarre taking so many classes on psychology and statistics and psychometrics, creating surveys and using SAS and SPSS and stuff, and never being taught about eugenics. I am not saying that statistics is never a useful tool. I like math sometimes. I, I think statistics can be useful in understanding what's going on in the world. However, I just personally don't think statistics should be done without recognition and grappling with its racist history. There is a lot I could get into here, but like the basics are uh, the two like fathers of statistics that you have probably heard of. Both of them were into eugenics. Um, we've got Francis Galton. He developed ideas like correlation, um, regression to the mean. He was the first one to do statistical surveys. Um, and he also literally coined the word eugenics. And Carl Pearson, who is known for p-values, um, histograms, principal component analysis, if you've ever done that, chi-squared tests, a lot of different tests. Um, he was also a massive racist, anti-Semite, and super into eugenics. And that's how statistics was built. It was built as a way of making disabled people seem lesser than, a way of making anyone who wasn't white seem lesser than. Um, and that is what statistics was originally used for. And when we do statistics in psychology without explicitly recognizing that, it is very, very easy to slip back into those ideas and use statistics in the same racist ways. And nobody in psychology wants to talk about that. And I saved a couple tweets in relevance to this that are both about, like, therapy practices and their history of being fucked up that I'm going to read for you and put up on the screen over here, as well as link in the description. Um, the first one is from at Twitchy Spoonie, 
and it's like a little thread where they talk about the reactions to critiquing therapy. A lot of y'all are just mad at my critique of therapy because you assume it's something that it's not. It's like trying to argue with people about the police when they still believe it's the police's job to protect you, like y'all don't understand what therapy is for. And like the police, the propaganda doesn't match the actual job description. Just because the police say what they do is protect and serve doesn't mean that's their actual job. Therapists are not meant to make you feel better or just generally work out your issues. They are there to treat what Eurocolonial medicine identifies as pathologies that get in the way of you performing your role under capitalist colonialism and to isolate you from that society should you be too dysfunctional for it. That doesn't mean that no one can go to or find value in therapy, but I wonder what's so threatening to observe this as the purpose. It is in writing, it is there if you want to look. But maybe it's the same reason people insist the police are there to protect us. I just thought that thread was well worded and I wanted to share. Hello, this is your third and final content warning that I'm about to discuss racism relatively in detail. Um, I'm reading a thread that discusses the abuses that black people faced during the slave trade. If you do not want to hear about that, you can skip to around 23 minutes and 30 seconds. I will also put that time on the screen. You do not have to listen to me talk about this if you do not want to. And then the second one is from Janelle Cubbage, uh, who is a therapist that studies suicide. Um, and she tweeted, a fact that has stuck with me since I've learned it, in part because it's so disturbing, is that some of the first suicide prevention strategies were developed in response to African captives dying by suicide on slave ship. It reminds me a lot of how the origins of many helping professions and fields were wrapped up with white supremacy, upholding and advancing it. For example, the invention of drapetomania, a psychiatric illness that overtook enslaved people and caused them to run away. Slave owners needed an explanation of why enslaved people would run away, because the most obvious and in-your-face answer just couldn't be true. The treatment for this fake illness whipped the devil out of them and amputate toes. Mysteriously, sarcasm, a sign of the illness was lesions on the back. Again, the in-your-face obvious answer is ignored. This feigned ignorance also happened in the context of trying to keep captive Africans from dying by suicide through the Middle Passage. Slavers were well aware of the physical and psychological trauma captive Africans were subject to. How do we know? They documented mass melancholy and gloomy pensiveness among their cargo, and even heard some of the Africans say in their native language that they wanted to die. Many captive Africans preferred death to their enslavement. Instead of addressing the obvious in-your-face answer about what was driving their despair, melancholy, and gloomy pen pensiveness, slavers instead attempted to deny Africans of their agency to choose death over enslavement. This is further underscored by slavers understanding that sickness, failed revolts, and despair were common precipitating factors of suicide on board. One way the captive Africans would attempt suicide was by refusing to eat. The speculum oris was developed to forcibly feed them, which is a speculum that goes in the mouth. They also used unspeakable violence against Africans who refused to eat in an attempt to achieve their submission and intimidate other Africans who might be thinking about doing the same. I want to reiterate the amount of thinking and planning that went into preventing suicides. A Danish medical officer said they had to use the greatest forethought to prevent it, because slaves used any and every opportunity to kill themselves. They reduced access to strips of linen, string, and rope to prevent the captive Africans from dying by suicide from hanging. There is one prevention method that we still use today. To prevent captive Africans from jumping overboard to die by suicide, slavers ensured rails on the deck were high and or would use netting on the ships to catch them. In addition to these physical devices, slavers also weaponized the captive Africans' spiritual beliefs against them, telling them that, that if they died by suicide, their souls would not return to Africa like they thought. In typical fashion, suicides by captives and enslaved people were pathologized and chalked up to something being wrong with African people. Abolitionists argued the contrary. These suicides were a product of the oppressive, brutal nature of slavery in the slave trade. And then she links a book for further reading. Um, again, that thread will be linked in the description. Apologies that that was long and depressing, um, but I think it's really important in terms of how psychology today continues to use practices that were literally developed to oppress people. Um, I just think it's really important and it is not something that is taught in psychology classes. Um, if this next part gets a little philosophically laden, forgive me, um, but I think I can say this in a way that you will understand. Um, I wrote an essay for one of my favorite philosophy classes two semesters ago. Um, and I wanted to share some of it adapted uh, with you. I went through it and kind of edited it to make it more accessible for YouTube. Um, 
If this doesn't make sense, feel free to ask questions, that's fine. I don't expect you to know what I'm talking about necessarily, um, but I think you will understand. I wrote this for one of my favorite philosophy classes. It was taught by Robert Paul Wolf. Uh, it was called From Marx to Marcuse or something like that. He was absolutely lovely to have as a professor and I personally really like the way that he lectures. He's actually put a lot of lectures on YouTube because he believes in free access to information. Um, and I'm actually going to link those playlists down below. If you enjoy what I'm about to discuss, then you might want to check out those videos um, because it is literal hours of free college level courses um, from a guy that has spent like 70 years studying Marx. Just don't tell him I sent you, please. This is not a joke. Please don't tell him I sent you. It is there if you want to access it. I think he's a great lecturer um, and he has some really, really interesting ideas. Um, this next bit I am going to read directly from my screen because I wrote it. Anything that needs to be cited, again, will be linked in the description. I entered college with a psychology major because I thought I knew what I wanted to do, be a gender therapist. I wanted to work with trans kids, help them navigate through the barriers to transition and lead them through the often complex feelings that can result from building one's own gender, coming out and transitioning. I knew that capitalism and various forms of oppression had huge impacts on mental health, and I wanted to incorporate that understanding into a therapy practice, but I wasn't exactly sure how. I hoped college would help teach me that. I've been a self-proclaimed anarchist since high school, but college gave me the time to read more theory and the opportunity to engage with other radicals, both professors and peers. The more I became enamored by anarchism, Marxism, disability justice, prison and police abolition, trans liberation, black and intersectional feminism, and all of it, the more and more I became critical of the field of psychology as a whole. Yeah, I learned a lot in college, but what I learned just radicalized me further to the extent that psychology no longer aligns with my values. My path has changed, and that change is in large part due to my growing skepticism of how therapy and mental health care are structured within the system that we live. Psychology courses often emphasize that mental health issues arise due to a combination of factors, frequently categorized into personal characteristics such as genetics, brain chemistry, grit, etc., and situational factors, family, community, and cultural context, relationships, other life circumstances. This seems like a relatively simple idea, but there are complexities that are researched in various ways, with some psychologists focusing on the social, others on the more scientific, and still others on the overlap between the two. After completing the dozens of hours of coursework required for a BA in psychology, not once did a single class allude to, let alone adequately address, how capitalism and various forms of social oppression function to all but destroy humanity's psychological well-being. These are all rhetorical questions, but how are you supposed to maintain good mental health when you are living in a system that, by design, exploits you? How are you meant to understand yourself and create meaning in a world where your worth is assigned to you based on your productivity? How are you going to heal through self-care when what matters the most is community care, interdependence, compassion, and space for healing? How are you expected to develop a positive self-image when every non-normative aspect of who you are is stigmatized, villainized, exploited, discouraged, and furthermore pathologized through psychology, the very system that is supposed to help you? I think Marx's theory of alienation is helpful in understanding this. He writes that the structure of labor, that structure being inherently exploitative, uh, estranges people from both their labor and from themselves. Because a worker's labor does not belong to oneself, and it is instead capitalized upon for their boss's profit, the worker does not develop free mental and physical energy, but mortifies his body and ruins his mind. When we're refused the time and ability to freely act and create, we lose an aspect of our selfhood. It is far more difficult to maintain good mental health when your humanity itself is systemically and intentionally torn away from you by the very system that you have no choice but to live within. A more recent but similarly applicable idea can be found in Marcuse's arguments in One Dimensional Man, which centers on the idea that people have surrendered their selfhood to authoritarian control, creating what he calls one dimensionality of self, thought, society, and individuals. We are told that we're free by the very same institutions that diminish our freedoms, and we are indoctrinated into believing that our life is good and whole. Simultaneously, our unhappiness with that system is repressed and our descent is continually discouraged, and the hell that man has made for man feels insurmountable. We don't feel like we can revolt, we don't feel like revolution is possible, we feel as if there isn't any hope and we are stuck in the system. Later in the book, Marcuse even references how psychology has moved away from considering that mental illnesses are rooted in human responses to an immoral world. Instead, physicians are meant to fix their patients by preparing them to once again function normally, which of course necessitates being a productive laborer. If you are unhappy because of an inherently unfulfilling and one-dimensional society, you are told not that society is the problem, but that you are and something within you needs to be fixed. Considering both views, it's relatively clear to me that authoritarian capitalism is a structure under which psychological human well-being as a whole is not supported or even considered to be important. The current prevalence of mental health issues should not be surprising then given that we live in a system that actively produces them. 
Unsurprisingly, though, this is not something that psychology as a field recognizes, and it is something that capitalists either want to hide or do not want to believe. If the working class as a whole were to realize that the structure of capitalism functions not only to exploit them, but to destroy their potential for positive self-conception and good mental health, they may develop a stronger sense of class consciousness. And oh, how disastrous that would be. In Capitalist Realism, Mark Fisher similarly recognizes that contemporary capitalism contributes to bad mental health, noting that the stress and distress caused by it reveals how inherently dysfunctional capitalism as a system is. At the book's conclusion, Fisher discusses affective disorders, which is a group of mood disorders like depression, bipolar, um, substance use disorders, as internalizations of discontent, uh, importantly that discontent is with capitalism, um, that ought to be redirected into anger towards capitalism. I think that it is misguided to generalize all affective disorders in this way as he does. Uh, genetics are known to play a part in affective disorders, and they can arise due to discontent with issues unrelated to capitalism, such as the death of a family member. But with a slight yet significant rewording of Fisher's argument, I would readily argue that many affective disorders can be traced back to hierarchies and oppression, perhaps most notably capitalism, racism, the history of slavery, transphobia, homophobia, misogyny, a host of other sorts of things. And treating these things as individual problems rather than symptoms of an unjust social and economic structure only serves to ignore their source and reinforce those oppressive systems. For a moment, let's turn away from the philosophy of the issue and ask what psychology has to say. One psychological theory that attempts to address the robust connections between oppression and mental health is the minority stress model, a concept that is drawn from the work of many researchers and solidified as a framework by Ellen Meyer. The theory states that increased prevalence of mental illnesses in marginalized populations is largely due to the social stress that comes with being marginalized. It was originally developed in order to explain that the high rates of suicide, addiction, and mood disorders in lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals are due to the oppression that they face rather than their orientations themselves being problematic. Since its original theorization by Meyer, though, the theory has been expanded due to its applicability to various marginalized groups. What's most notable about the minority stress model in relation to this discussion is not the model itself, but the psychological literature that has emerged because of it. There have been studies discussing minority stress in relation to the mental health of people of color, immigrants, trans people, and even low socioeconomic classes. Broadly, studies all agree that higher rates of mental health issues in marginalized populations are often both directly and indirectly impacted by and caused by the social stress that those populations experience due to their oppression. It's been used to link the oppression of trans people and eating disorders, for instance, something that I wrote an entire literature review of my freshman year, if you're interested in me talking more about that. I could. Invariably, though, researchers respond to this information by encouraging things like fostering resilience, which is it's a characteristic deemed one of the most protective factors for marginalized individuals in developing positive mental health and outcomes, but it's kind of abstract and it's not something that we've exactly figured out how to foster or creating intervention programs that identify at-risk youth, which can be helpful for some people. It feels to me that psychologists in this case are treating burns while allowing a massive fire to blaze on. It's like, I don't know, it just doesn't seem like it's getting to the root of the problem to me. I desire a more radical approach to mental health and psychology, not one where we have to heal the people who suffer at the hands of exploitative hierarchies, but one where people are not harmed by domination in the first place, one where those unjust systems do not exist at all. It is quite clear to me that systems of domination, notably capitalism, racism, homophobia, etc., are damaging to the mental health of the billions of people who do not control them. There's both social theory like that of Marx and Marcuse and Fisher, and more empirical research like Myers that supports this idea. With an understanding that capitalism and the associated forces of social marginalization directly impact the mental health of everyone that lives underneath them, I want to ask what mental health could look like in a world without capitalism or any form of social marginalization, oppression, or prejudice. Perhaps the change most commonly advocated for, but one that is sorely needed nonetheless, is large-scale restructuring of healthcare. It should be free and accessible to everyone, obviously, and trauma and culturally informed therapy of various types must be included in that. People seeking mental health care should not be forcibly institutionalized in any way, as they currently sometimes are. Mental health treatments, including medications, should be clearly explained to and discussed with patients, including risks of treatment and their alternatives. Addiction should be treated like a health issue instead of a criminal one, with harm reduction at the center of its treatment programs and incarceration never considered as an option. I cannot even pretend to know all of the ways in which current systems of mental health care fails those that it attempts to aid, but I dream that increased attention to informed consent and the destruction of a profit motive will be a large step in the right direction. Given that capitalism serves to greatly exacerbate many mental health issues, it's easy to expect that its destruction would lead to a great reduction in a variety of affective disorders. This is certainly a good thing, but I think it's important to note that the abolition of 
capitalism and hierarchies would not solve every mental health issue. As I referenced previously, mental health outcomes are due to a combination of factors, and even though oppressive social and economic forces will no longer create unease, brain chemistry, genetics, and stressors that are not institutional, like breakups or deaths, um, will certainly still be a factor in mental health. At the same time, it's also possible for the abolition of capitalism to decrease the salience of these things over time. When we live as we currently do, alienated according to Marx, one-dimensionally according to Marcuse, internalizing our disconsent with capitalism according to Fisher, of course we have less of a capacity to manage personal stressors. When I imagine a world after capitalism, I dream that everyone will be allowed time to grieve, and nobody will have to miss funerals for fear of losing their jobs. I hope that stronger care networks and support systems will emerge for everyone when our lives are no longer defined by labor, and we will increasingly be able to rely on each other for emotional support through events like breakups or deaths. It may be too utopian to assume affective disorders will disappear completely in a post-capitalist world, but I do think it's safe to assume that their prevalence will be greatly reduced. There are some things that I don't think we can responsibly predict, one of them being the exact role of psychiatric drugs, but I'm not going to get into that now. Affective disorders have the highest prevalence of all mental health issues, and they are most frequently blamed on the stressors of capitalism, but they are far from the only type of mental illnesses, and many discussions of mental health post-capitalism are weaker because they do not fully consider this. Um, in addition to affective disorders, there are psychotic disorders, personality disorders, eating disorders, and trauma-related disorders. Those are the main categories that the DSM and other psychiatric institutions abide by. Um, there are other categories as well, and they often overlap with one another. For example, some personality disorders are also trauma-related disorders. Um, the connections between capitalism and affective disorders are the clearest, likely at least in part due to their pervasiveness and the ease of studying them, and affective disorders are also those most frequently referenced in work like Marcuse's, Myers, and Fisher's. Um, to begin to remedy this oversight, I would like to briefly consider each of the aforementioned categories and how they may relate to capitalism in a future without it. Psychotic disorders are characterized by hallucinations and delusions. Um, they've been politicized for a long time, actually, which Fisher recognizes in his book, citing the discussions born in the 60s of psychosis as a political category rather than a natural one. A restructuring of our understanding of mental health post-capitalism must, I would argue, consider what diagnoses and rigid categories are useful for in the first place. People with psychotic symptoms should be listened to and trusted in the creation of their own treatment plans, and they should never be forcibly institutionalized as they are today. Personality disorders, even today, are a frequent topic of diagnostic contest within psychology. Similarly to psychotic disorders and mental health diagnoses at large, a complete reconsideration of both how and why they are considered disorders has to be done. The primary diagnostic criterion for a personality disorder is a marked deviation from the expectations of an individual's culture, and the third criterion is significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other areas of functioning. Put colloquially, if you act in a culturally non-conforming way that leads to discomfort or disruption in your workplace, you already meet two of the central diagnostic criteria for a personality disorder. Um, to me, this is a striking example of how Marx's idea of alienation applies today. Capitalism so clearly deeply harms us when whether or not we are considered sick is directly associated with how well we are able to perform our work. I cannot attempt to predict how the categorization of tre and treatment of personality disorders will change post-capitalism, um, but I imagine a healthier social system and a deep restructuring of how we relate to labor will certainly influence uh, how traits currently categorized as personality disorders will present. Eating disorders are a category that famously includes the most deadly mental illnesses, um, and they are very susceptible to influence by social pressures. Women, non-binary people, and trans people tend to be at a higher risk for restrictive eating disorders, and this is not a coincidence. There have been increasing discussion and research on the large role that fat phobia and diet culture, beauty standards, medical malconstructions of weight like BMI, all of those have a giant role in sparking and exacerbating eating disorders. Also importantly, fat phobia is targeted disproportionately towards women. Similarly to affective disorders, I do not think that the destruction of capitalism could entirely eliminate the eating disorders, but I do think that a society without social oppression could significantly loosen their grasp. Um, also importantly, free and more accessible treatments will be more effective than the current costly and isolating options. Trauma-related disorders are often associated with combat trauma. Uh, your stereotypical PTSD patient is a veteran. Um, it may be naive to say that a future without capitalism is also one without war, but I can hope. Without war, or at the very least without the completely inhumane and profiteering war practices that currently are on vogue, um, it is reasonable to expect a sharp decrease in people experiencing war-related PTSD. Uh, still, though, there are other sources of trauma that can cause PTSD, CPTSD, or other trauma-related disorders. Incarceration is a massive one. 
abuse, domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, etc. While incarceration-based trauma is comparatively an easy fix because prison abolition has been in many people's definition of a post-capitalist future for a long time, um, issues of abuse and assault are more complicated and I'm not going to get into that right now, but there's definitely a lot of anarchist literature on how those things relate to power and how restructuring of power can relate to decreased risks of sexual violence as well as better, healthier ways of dealing with sexual violence and things like that um, without incarceration. All of that is a long way to say the world that I want to build is one with free and effective mental health care, an anti-oppressive social system that can mediate stressors before they turn into affective disorders, and above all, a world entirely free from capitalism and prisons and everything that creates the ditch of mental health that currently kind of ticks over the whole world. I feel like that was maybe the majority of the video, but you're welcome for being an academic genius. <laughs> the last couple of things that I wanted to mention before I close out this video are the psychiatric survivorship movement and critical psychiatry as a discipline. Um, these are both more psychiatry related than psychology in general, right? But I think they are very relevant. I'm not going to get too deep into either of them, but the psychiatric survivors movement is essentially a movement of people who survived the psychiatric system and have spoken against it. Um, it started in the 60s, 70s, but there is definitely still a live community of uh, psychiatric survivors today, and I will link to some resources regarding that in the description. Critical psychiatry is a little bit harder to discuss because psychology and psychiatry as like academic institutions are very, very anti-critical psychiatry, um, which is maybe unsurprising considering it is, you know, critical of psychiatry. But I don't know, I think academic disciplines should be very receptive to criticism, and if someone is pointing out massive flaws in your department, you should maybe listen to them and like see what they have to say instead of being like, you're trying to make money. <laughs> you know, I think that maybe sometimes that's not always the case. People into critical psychiatry in general argue that a lot of psychiatric diagnoses are misrepresentations of collections of symptoms that are not necessarily from a mental illness um, and more so responses to trauma, right? Which is kind of what I was talking about. But it is complicated and there's a lot to critical psychiatry and I don't agree with all of it. Um, but I will leave some resources in the description. So if you want to learn more about the psychiatric survivors movement or critical psychiatry, those are there, along with some lectures by Robert Paul Wolf and a handful of other things that I mentioned throughout this video. Um, so yeah, if all of this was interesting to you, I hope you check out those links. There's some good stuff down there. And uh, I would love to continue this conversation in the comments. Everyone say bye to my cat. That was a little treat for those of you that stayed to the end. Um, yeah, thanks for watching. I'd love to continue this discussion. I know this video was probably a touch long, but there were some super insightful comments about psychology on my last video where I only like mentioned this topic. So I am sure that we will have some delightful little discussions and I would love to love to see that happen. So, okay, I hope that your mental health is minimally impacted by the oppressive forces that surround you because it's rough out here. Um, but to be completely honest, understanding the way that capitalism and assorted um, systems of social marginalization have impacted my mental health has been very, very good for me. And I would encourage you to do the same and kind of reflect on that because it can be rough um, and it can definitely bring up some stuff. But overall, I think it's an important thing to think about um, and you don't have to think about it alone. And I'll talk to you later, maybe.